Thank you for joining us today at the Center for Global Security Research within the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. My name is Asmara Askedom, and I'm the Associate Deputy Director of the Center. Our lecture today is entitled, An Era of Accelerated Scale Change, Implications and the Critical Role of the National Lab. Our speaker is Toby Rutshaw. Toby has had a long career as a global technology innovator and a business executive. He's worked in Silicon Valley, Next Gen Startups, Fortune 20 Enterprises, the first 5G labs, and also in military and government. Today, he's bringing his knowledge and expertise on emerging tech changes to communicate to lab audience what role the lab can play in future innovation. So per usual with CGSR lectures, Toby will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll turn to the audience for Q&A. Uh, feel free to start raising your hands electronically um, and also typing questions into the chat uh, before the Q&A session starts, and I'll just start getting you guys into the queue. Uh, with that said, Toby, it's my pleasure to welcome you to CGSR. I'll turn it over to you to start the lecture. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, got a lot of ground to cover. I think it's one of the most exciting times um, in tech. I'm going to blast through this really quickly, set a timer so I hit the 45 minutes, because I do think the Q&A um, is the most interesting part usually in uh, in these things. And hopefully some of the early questions get answered by some of the later slides. So if we jump to the next slide, um, let me tell you basically the, stor the storyline that we're going to go through. So I'm absolutely convinced we're in one of the biggest uh, uh, entering one of the biggest sets of change waves in decades. There's the thing we've all heard about from the World Economic Forum in Davos, which is the fourth uh, industrial revolution, but that is just part of the story. Um, one of the things that I'm going to drill into a tiny bit is that when you look at look back historically through economic or or military history for this sort of thing, some of the biggest winners in commercial history, some of the biggest winners are people that innovated at a, a model level. Um, this is going to drive a giant uh, creative destruction um, cycle as uh, as did the other um, uh, uh, industrial revolutions. Um, no one ever believes they're going to be on the destruction side of those cycles. Everybody from companies to countries to sectors, we're you know, we're going to be fine. We're, we're leaders. We're going to be great. Um, and then you look back and see that there was no contingency planning, no, uh, no real reaction. Uh, I think, um, national competitiveness, which is really important for what I call national health and, and national, uh, security will require us doing things differently. There's no way a company or a nation or a sector goes through these sort of changes and doesn't readjust uh, strategically and at a, a mission level. So I'm going to run you through the change waves, drill down into 5G and some of the key technologies there, go through the logic and the tech behind the fourth industrial revolution, a slightly different look at uh, a, an AI, talk a little bit about the amazing uh, speed of science and where, where I see that going, uh, and then some of the imperatives and, and how that links into uh, ecosystems and then end with, of course, uh, Charles Dickens. So if we jump to the next uh, next slide. So I, I think there's enormous opportunity, enormous risk in the next decade. Um, declining GDP per capita and increasing cross-cultural conflictive currents. That's where there are conflictive currents within groups, within a, a nation or a society. Historically, that never, ever, ever ends well. Um, so declining GDP is something you really want to avoid and something that is more and more, uh, connected to how competitive we are in, in the, in the global markets. Uh, it's not a, uh, it's not a hot war. It's a economic war and, um, there are very, very fierce competitors emerging. And if they manage the strategic and tactical changes of this next decade better than us, then, then we've got a problem. Um, leveraging our national assets will be really critical. Other countries uh, are further down the path uh, structurally uh, on those. I do think we have some of the best uh, national uh, assets uh, out there, whether it's the state schools or the national labs um, or some of the ecosystems that we have. So, so I think it would be a shame not to be purposeful about that. And I'm, connected to one, two, three 
governmental things uh, attempting to, to work on that. So if we jump to the next slide. So uh, I think as we exit the year, we're going to be in the middle of about 14 large change waves that I know of. I think there's a couple of three more, depending how you want to how you want to uh, scale of them. As you go through change um, like this, historically, if you don't adjust your strategy properly, you have real problems, and you can never adjust strategy without rethinking mission. And if you rethink mission, there are tasks and talent and structural and, co and communication. Um, uh, elements that that have to be uh, addressed. Uh, also, I think we need to be a little more outside in uh, on this, understanding what other nations are doing and how they're going after innovation leverage uh, is really important. I think France, uh, if you knew what been, what's been going on in France the last ten years, it would it would be uh, uh, shocking. Partly because they were just so really really bad at it. Uh, although they also have some pretty interesting. Um, uh, scientific uh, uh, labs and institutions. I know they do good work on on superconductivity. I think out of out of Toulouse. Um, so next slide. So this is kind of a strange one for this audience, but there's a giant evolution going on um, uh, systematically, structurally, and and how we think about supply chain uh, across the world. A lot of that has got to do with information flows and intelligence, and that's going to permeate uh, everything. I think you're going to see the rise of digital snackable intelligence uh, and heuristics, which is a new thing. Um, one of the scariest things is for the first time ever, we're starting to see agile, the capabilities of agile at scale. Uh, we'll drill into that a little bit more uh, uh, later. Um, something you're awfully familiar with, the acceleration and expansion uh, uh, of science and the uh, the cycle time from scientific uh, work to economic impact is, is is shrinking. I think that's a really important uh, part of this, um, even in your own community, uh, but across almost everything you're seeing, uh, uh, rigid silo structures um, uh, start to dissolve. Uh, you're seeing that starting in, in certain areas in education. You're definitely seeing that in, in, uh, in business. Um, ecosystems, uh, we used to have a few really giant advantages. Uh, I know we had early ones in, in space around uh, ecosystems. Silicon Valley was a very unique thing for a long time that is no longer true. Um, back to the point on conflictive culture, uh, cultural cross currents, uh, those are, you'd have to be in a cave not to know those aren't uh, rising around the world and specifically here in the States. Uh, historically, that has led to some, especially with uh, GDP problems, has led to some very uh, difficult uh, problems. Uh, the end of dynasties in uh, in China and Portugal, although technically it's uh, not a it's a monarchy in Portugal. Uh, the modern um, history of Czechoslovakia is another great uh, a great example. Or several, uh, uh, the Arab Spring uh, is another one. Um, it's also historically a unique time, and this relates to things that spin out of the scientific community, to go from idea on PowerPoint to scale competitor really fast, um, bypassing manufacturing, even company formation. Uh, um, we do a really good job of keeping rocket components out of Gaza, uh, so they started 3D printing them, uh, and one sort of military example. Um, but others, I can, uh, I know startups that have been two kids in a PowerPoint and they've basically rented uh, people, uh, uh, technology, asset stacks um, to go build their startups. The, the new thing now, it's crazy easy to do that for not only labor, but also distribution and also manufacturing. Um, and so the the ability to go, okay, well, that's a challenging startup. I can look at it again in 10 years. That is no longer a, uh, um, uh, an item. And that will include clever things that come out of the scientific community. If we jump to uh, page two on this one, um, the fourth industrial revolution, we're going to dig into that. Um, look, the, the really smart people uh, at Davos and has written some good work out of Oxford and, uh, and, and uh, Stanford on this. They call it an industrial revolution because of the scale of that, right? The last three changed the world. Um, there's a uh, big five in AI uh, where we're seeing a lot of changes. I think everybody's uh, uh, 
overly familiar with the Gen AI uh, wave uh, that's going on. Uh, there's so much money uh, and attention uh, going into that. There's a massive Legoization of AI that's been going on for about seven years, um, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, scale, uh, um, hyperscale, hyperspeed uh, AI is a relatively uh, new thing. Um, the price performance change on that is a thousand X, and that's already out in the in the marketplace, and that's a um, a game changer. And then edge compute with real time AI and federated AI, you're starting to see things uh, uh, really uh, happen there. And then I think you're going to see um, uh, some really clever things with synthetic data, which is an accelerant for all of that. The other uh, um, the other big change that's going on is tech Lego legalization and the low code no code, so that the actual technology construction and innovation is going to be three or four or five times faster than it is today. Um, and not for super innovative stuff, but just for everyday uh, uh, everything, uh, that that becomes easier and better. We talked a little bit about science acceleration. That's one of them. The, the scariest part of this for me, uh, besides the, you know, the, the national economic threat, is the most positive Darwinian evolutionary space I know of is the dark web. And every one of these things gets adopted there, if not first, close to first, and gets applied in a very, very pragmatic way. Uh, and that should uh, uh, that should worry us all. Um, and then I think the other sort of strange one is places start to move towards being uh, eight dimensional. And I'm in a few conversations with uh, emerging spaces on this where you've got, you know, a space would become, I mean, clearly it's, it, it's physically three dimensions. Uh, and then there's a th synthetic real uh, dimension, which I've, I've played with that a little bit and it's uh, mind boggling what you can do with that. That's tied to AR, VR, MR, but also a, a real time synthetic, um, uh, hundred percent, uh, hyper real, uh, um, view of what, where, what you are and where you are. Um, Real-time instrumentation and intelligence uh, around sensorization, uh, whether that's a, a battle space or a town or a Disney park. And then um, recognition, response, and personalization that goes along with that. And for those of you keeping score at home, that's only seven time is the eighth dimension of that, where you'll be able to rewind uh, forwards and backwards on those things. So all of those things together really, really big, uh, uh, really big set of uh, uh, changes. So let's jump into the next slide. And so, and then on to the next one. So going back through history, um, it's the model level that really uh, works. The guy in the fancy outfit on the left is von Clausewitz. He's the father of uh, modern military strategy, which means he's the grandfather of uh, business strategy. That's his foremost disciple, uh, uh, Field Marshal von Moltke. He's the guy who said uh, no plan survives its first contact with the battlefield. He literally took two network technologies, um, the rail network and the telegraph network, which were relatively new in the 1860s, and redefined what a standing army was and made it more agile, more effective and cheaper. Uh, I wasn't the smartest guy at business school, but more agile, more effective and cheaper is a winning uh, winning combo. He was also really good at very early uh, early adoption of uh, of tech, um, even rickety tech like that, uh, uh, like that needle gun thing. So if we jump to the next, there's a couple more examples. These folks took uh, emerging technologies and didn't go you know, how do I use this in my business? They sat back and they said, how do I change the model of my uh, uh, of, of my business? Um, von Richthofen's a little bit of a stretch. His change of the model really did involve tons of technology. It was just, I'm gonna change what fighting and engagement means. I'm never ever gonna fight anybody who knows I'm here. And so uh, by the time you knew you were in a fight with von Richthofen, you were, you were dead. Uh, Sears, Uber in the abstract, travel agents, of course. I think the next one's coming up. The me media video consumption uh, market will have a giant model change just because of economics and, uh, and the new layers of intelligence. Healthcare, um, uh, absolutely a uh, case. I think healthcare, food supply, education, training, all of those go. And, and then maybe national labs and national competitiveness we rethink uh, uh, that model and find ways to tweak uh, for the better. So if we jump onto the next slide. 
Okay, so the fourth industrial revolution. Next slide, I'm going to jump uh, into 5G because that's sort of a central underpinning uh, thing. 5G is really two things. One is it's a lot better. The other is a quantum leap. Um, but there's always in these things the over-egging and the over-excitement. Uh, the future ex-CEO of Qualcomm in, in 2020 said 5G would generate $13.2 trillion in economic activity had a huge paper uh, supporting that written by smart people at some consulting firm, uh, a, a little a little bit of an exaggeration, but directionally correct. Um, jumping to the, the next slide. So 5G is really two things, right? It's really crazy fast, real time uh, latency, how quick you get a response. Um, the throughput uh, is massive. Um, uh, how much you can download in bursts uh, and what's top end um, is you can it can talk to things moving really really fast 500 kilometers an hour uh, of course it only talks to things going in metric speeds most most business groups i talk to don't get that joke by the way but maybe it's just not funny uh it'll do a million devices per square kilometer that's like a thousand um a thousand times denser for sensorization it's software, so service deployment is at the speed of software, and that's kind of the big difference. 4G is a boxes and wires uh, telecom network. This is a software-defined cloud-native network. It's 10x more energy efficient, which is a money and an environment uh, thing, and it's way more energy efficient with IoT devices, which again, another accelerant for change. But the really big deal is that it's a communications and compute, compute fabric uh, um, Put together, the edge of the of, a, of the telecom network automatically becomes a real time uh, compute uh, capability, and you know the the world generally exists in a real time mode. And doing and changing things there technologically is a a vast undiscovered uh, uh, country. You're going to see on the back of this a lot of event driven architectures, which those will then have big upstream ripple effects all the way back. Uh, which is kind of the opposite of the way things have worked in the past. So if you go to the next slide, uh, just a few quick examples. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is the kind of things you can do with edge compute. Um, dumb $50 cameras turn into magic sensorization devices. Uh, when I was at Verizon, we coined the term photonic sensorization, mostly so we could charge more because it's, you know, two really big words. Uh, but it's real time and precision intelligence from very, very cheap uh, uh, ubiquitous devices. Um, real time intelligence in operations and uh, quality control. Um, those those sort of things um, just spin off money and get adopted for those very reasons. And then, you know, I think the whole space of uh, knowledge transfer, education, training. Uh, changes tremendously with immersive creation and consumption, uh, where people and spaces and knowledge flow much, much easier. And again, uh, that's about event driven architectures and what I call the now backwards loop, right? So I'm having intelligence injected into now, and that has ripple effects back uh, backwards to change things that feed now. Um, jumping on to the next slide. So here's the big deal. The next slide shows the logic behind what the really clever people at, um, uh, at Davos uh, believe. Um, but here, here's sort of one of the, the barriers. Um, most modern tech compared to tech of 20, 25 years ago, you know, if I had to explain middleware and metadata management or web services management and policy control, it would make your head hurt. Uh, maybe not this audience, but a general business audience to make their head hurt. Um, this stuff is conceptually simple, but it's really hard to e execute well, and it requires hands-on practices and real time on the field. It's sort of like you can't learn to swim by watching a video, right? This is hands-on stuff. There are a lot of things you can learn uh, uh, from videos, but this is hands-on uh, uh, practical stuff. Um, next slide. Uh, the other big deal, on to the next slide. Um, so, most companies and institutions, this shouldn't be a shock to uh, anybody, uh, are not structured, designed to learn through playing with new techs and tools. And most companies and institutions are absolutely awful at positive failure management, which is really key to uh, uh, managing, through, uh, uh, managing through this stuff. 
out in the in the corporate world and a little bit in the um uh the military world if you ask uh i think there was a survey of a thousand ceos and asked them how good where they fit in sort of the the ranking of this and i think uh 95 percent of them said they were in the top five percent uh at this which is you know mathematically problematic um so jumping on the next slide i'm going to show you the underpinnings of the fourth industrial revolution it's about scale uh and timing i think we'd all agree with this graph right if you look back at any of those four technologies from an impact utility adoption value or scale perspective really big changes in the last dozen years or so the real story is on the next slide if you just go four or five years into the future um that steep part of the curve that we've just experienced looks flat you know and i and and i'm happy to ask answer questions on this at the end but i've been neck deep in all of these since they were born um except to ai because it's kind of older than i am um uh, and i've got evidence on all of these and i think we're seeing some of that in the ai side very very clearly uh now but that is the change now imagine if these as these old hockey stick in a utility scale impact adoption value perspective that there's a software defined cloud native compute uh um uh platform with fantastic bandwidth super response time and energy management for centralization that they can all live on man that would create a pretty interesting flywheel effect well that's the logic behind the uh, fourth industrial revolution um, that they believe is going to change and everything, just like other industrial revolutions. The super scary part of this is they think it's the next eight years, uh, not 50, like the previous uh, uh, revolutions. And like the previous ones, there will be sectors, militaries, countries um, that are winners and, and others that are terrible uh, losers. So if we jump on to the next slide, um, a lot of people refer to it as a cyber physical area where everything that can be connected will be connected. Um, I try to find a way to make this really, uh, really pragmatic. And what does all that technology stuff together really mean? And I think it's a bifurcation into things and operations and companies and militaries and labs and uh, healthcare centers that that take advantage of this as exhibited by the 10 p's and others that don't so what what are the 10 p's it's imagine imagine two hospitals one that doesn't uh adopt all of this new tech and one that does and the one that does is proactive predictive pattern matched preventative permission personalized process performant peer connected pragmatic and precise which one of those do you want to go to which one do you want to invest in right which one do you want to work at Clearly, there's a giant um, uh, advantage to that. The The interesting thing about those 10 Ps also, and I learned this 17 years at FedEx, where they are masters of process, the process performant intelligent company is the low cost one because there are less defects and higher quality uh, output. That leads also to something that I call evolutionary intelligence uh, and increased agility. Increased agility is easy, it's just faster sense and response time, which is really important in any competitive scenario, whether military or economic or, or, or scientific. Um, evolutionary intelligence is this thing feeds a sea of data from which you continually improve and analyze yourself uh, to get better. Uh, if you're in the other bucket, that, that doesn't really happen. Uh, a tip of the hat to John Fiocla at Harvard and Tim Chu uh, formerly at Harvard and Tim Chu, still at Stanford, who helped me uh, on the 10 P's, created a couple of those. So jumping to the next, uh, uh, the next one, um, and that's just, yeah, there we go. We can go there and keep going to the next one because we covered that other slide uh, already. So a slightly different view um, uh, uh, on AI, and this is where the math test is for the uh, uh, the audience. So, you know, there's a w way to think about AI that in, in differently, that there's really five types of AI, right? There's really, really hard stuff, like that stuff listed there, which is crazy difficult, and you need a bunch of PhDs, and it's trial and error, and it's just deep end, deep end of the pool. But out in the real world, it's not a lot of the uh, of the need for uh, for AI. Truly important, but Percentage-wise, it's kind of uh, small. There's the AI, uh, NLP, human augmentation stuff that's existed for a while. 
um, you know, that does operations and optimization, discovery and analysis. Um, that's that's actually slightly tricky. There's the large language model stuff that we've uh, that we've all seen uh, lately, and then the rest of it is uh, basically Lego, and has turned into Lego, which is the history of all technology and all complex parts of weapon systems. They get componentized and they turn into Lego, so you don't have to worry about building them or maintaining them. You just uh, just plug them in. And of course, the fifth one is not there. That bullet is missing. That is hyperscale, hyperspeed uh, uh, data, which is a relatively new thing. Um, uh, when you're talking about, um, you know, hyperspeed, 100 uh, petabytes, 50 petabytes to, you know, three or four uh, exabytes, we've never been able to really touch that in any economically uh, sound way. Um, interesting about Lego, it always shrinks and moves continually uh, closer to the edge. The, the whole low code, no code thing that we mentioned earlier is really moving forward fast. Um, AI is moving inside real time cycles and that'll happen with um, uh, the event driven architectures. Uh, there's a short article there uh, in a link uh, that was written before ChatGPT came out that talks about it sort of pokes NUS and HBS uh, in the eye a little bit on something they were saying about AI and it makes a contrary argument and has some details on that. Um, and the cost structure, speed and scale are taking unprecedented leaps forwards. Um, the Ocean, a company out of Chicago that does massive scale data uh, implemented something for the National Crime Bureau and they were using the best of breed kit that they had over very, very complex uh um large data sets and their response time was three days um after ocean it was three minutes that's a 1440x uh improvement we know technology does this all the time and jumps forward it never does a thousand or 200x uh, uh in a very short uh amount of time the difference between me walking backwards slowly in an f35 at top speed is a thousand x um the other side that that is going to play in this really in a big way, partly just because of the cost structures uh, uh, there, it's visual intelligence, including synthetic IoT. We're using a, an intelligent uh, edge with a dumb uh, $50 camera gives you photonic sensorization and that will fill, feed into this uh, uh, this cycle. So if we jump to the next uh, next slide, um, we talked about hyperscale. Here's the thing with Gen, Gen AI, right? In about six quarters, this thing's going to be 500x more uh, uh, cost effective. In, in technology, generally, you see a wave one set of innovators do some amazing things. And then wave two comes along and does wave two without the mistakes. Wave one, uh, wave two comes along and does wave one better without the mistakes that were wave one, the adoption of whatever the latest technologies and inventions are for wave two. And they kill wave one. And oftentimes, it's people who were in wave one and uh, uh, and moved on uh, and did that. But there's so much money and clever uh, work going on on the behind the curtain giant machines that drive uh, the large language model stuff that I'm absolutely confident it'll be 500x more cost effective in six quarters, which is a giant uh, accelerant. There's a C tidal wave of C funding uh, going to this. Uh, Mayfield raised 250 million in a blink of an eye for a seed fund for uh, Gen AI, um, and the money will drive this acceleration. For Velcro, everybody knows what Velcro is. There's seven lucrative patents around Velcro. There are a thousand lucrative patents around doing cool stuff with Velcro. That's the same sort of thing you're going to see uh, um, uh, see with this, just gasoline on the fire. CEO of GitHub says that 80% of code will be written by co-pilots in the near future. And when this starts to, to plug into uh, process intelligence over multiple agents, you're going to see a whole nother level uh, uh, of economic uh, activity. In the world that you live in, the research world, um, uh, Power Notes is a very interesting thing that I just saw last week at the MIT, Harvard Business School, PwC, Gen AI world thing that they did uh, kicked off in, um, uh, in, in Boston. The, the hidden thing about Gen AI is it's making pretty every much every board on the planet of a 
any company of any size going, uh oh, what are we going to do with this? And then that leads to a second question of like, well, what are we doing with AI in general? And then that leads to a third question of, ooh, well, how does that fit inside of all of our uh, all of our IT? And the answer to that question normally is gobbledygook because there's very few boards that have. Uh, more than one IT savvy person on the board, uh, and lots of boards have no IT savvy uh, people on the board, and most IT shops and OT shops are severely broken and uh, uh, and poorly run. I think the last McKinsey number I saw was seventy five percent of CEOs think their um, their IT shops are are pretty poor. I was talking to a uh, board of a big FS company in, in, in Britain recently, and they openly referred to their head of tech as a head of wet lettuce. I was like, I don't know that British term, but, but I think that's probably bad. Um, uh, knowledge on demand is kind of what they're starting to, uh, uh, talk to this. The thing they speak, speak about what they don't realize is that, that rather than the tools that live on top of it, the care and feeding of the knowledge platforms. Uh, will be the core value generator, not the uh, not the tools that live on top of it. Uh, jumping on to the next slide, um, the, you are going to see there's a big debate about whether it adds jobs or cuts jobs. It's going to eliminate headcount, right? I, if I have a hundred junior lawyers, at some point I'm going to need twenty with this thing. Um, copywriters, all kinds of other areas. Um, some very interesting things for uh, for uh, healthcare, um, but then that grows economic activity and that that increases headcount. But it headcount is not a generic thing. Some people will lose jobs and stay unemployed, and that has a drag. While other new jobs in other places get uh, uh, get invented. No one's thought through the wreckage uh, in the wake of accelerating this from a national competitiveness. Um, uh, perspective there there's not nearly enough work on talent supply chain and how we get through this thing that's moving really really fast um so the the way the competition works in these sort of things is you know you've got people who are really proud of how they compete and how they fight and they're fierce fighters and they've got you know data to prove how good they are um uh, and, and it's like being great knife fighters when the gun gets invented, right? It's, that's really, really problematic. Uh, the other thing that hasn't been thought through a lot yet is this makes consumers smarter, more intelligent, better organized, might lead to many mutualizations, uh, makes things a lot more transparent. Uh, this will also change branding and kill uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of advertising. So if you jump to the next slide, um, so two quick cautionary tales uh, is using um, one of the top tools uh, uh, this this week, and you know the, there was a thirteen point two trillion dollar number thrown around for uh, uh, impact. So I said, okay, give me uh, give me a list of countries with that add up GDP wise thirty more trillion, and it gave me two, which I thought, oh, that's nice. I only asked it for one, it gave me two. One was off by 70%, one was off by 150%. And so I told it, I said, hey, uh, that's uh, that's not right. Can you recalculate it? And it gave me this back, which, which is just as bad, right? Um, next slide's even better. Uh, my Gen Z daughter was, who's uh, um, home for a little while uh, on her way to, uh, to move to Asia. Um, saw a case of cider for 90 bucks and went, wow, that, that just seems really expensive. So I asked Jenny I to find me some ciders. It lists these side 10 ciders out. There's four of them uh, that are expensive. She Googled one of them and, and went, well, that's not even real. So I went back and asked it. I said, hey, I think not all of those are real. Can you put them in a table? Comes back and goes, oh, man, you're absolutely right. Uh, nine of these are real. This other one's not. Sorry about that. So then we looked at uh, we looked at them again, and it turns out they were all fake, and it included press releases, websites, Google Maps, uh, other web links, a link to a food and wine article that didn't exist. And so then I went back to it and I said, "Hey, um, you know what? I've checked these; they're all fake." And jump to the next slide, and I'm gonna I don't like reading slides, but I'm gonna read this. This is what it came back and said to me. 
as an AI system without perfect knowledge, I should not generate false evidence to cover up potential errors. That behavior could promote the spread of misinformation, which could would be harmful. I clearly make a mistake. I clearly made a mistake in this case. When you challenged me to provide proof of the cidery's existence, I should have simply acknowledged that I could not find any definitive evidence. Uh, from anarchist farm that anarchist farm cider is real and that it was likely an imaginary cidery that I had hallucinated originally. Generating fake links crossed an ethical line and demonstrates that I still have progress to make in being an honest, reliable AI assistant. Thank you for catching this fabrication. It is a learning experience and helps me improve my transparency. Uh, in the future, I will be more forthright in admitting when I do not have uh, actual evidence to back up claims, please, please feel free to continue challenging me this, this in situations my, my responses, uh, where my responses seem questionable or biased. So the very interesting thing about this, so I'm a, a trained philosopher in, uh, I go deep in epistemologies and, uh, and logic and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and linguistics. It really, the way it's constructed, it really doesn't know what it means uh, uh, when it says I will be more forthright, right? It has no idea. It's just doing mathematical, uh, pattern, um, uh, matching. So yeah, that's kind of terrifying. I know a company with 300,000 plus people in it that is putting every employee through 12 hours of training to use this stuff because they think it's great. Uh, jump to the next slide. So the emerging imperatives, what is all of this? Uh, what does all of this mean? Next slide. Um, so the speed and span of science, the rate of acceleration in science is accelerating. Um, a few examples you're you're very familiar with, I'm sure. Um, I mean, the the numbers on DNA sequencing over the last you know ten plus years are mind blowing. It's like you bought a convertible Rolls Royce for six hundred thousand dollars, and then you come back a few years later and go, hey, we'll give you another one for four four dollars. Um, don't know why I use that example, but I'm sure there's some of you out there looking at the convertible Rolls Royce. Um, it's actually named after my wife, which is why that comes up a lot. Um, but coincidentally, not, not actually, uh, there's a lot more combinatorial expansions going on. Um, synthetic bio, uh, now lives inside the engineering department at, the uh, uh, at the wonderful, um, uh, university of California in San Diego. Um, uh, and that's to accelerate the impact of SynBio by having discussions during design and invention around how to scale uh, manufacturing. Um, I am absolutely sure, uh, I spent a, quite a bit of time studying the history of science and scientific thought. I am absolutely sure in an accelerated compact time frame, we are going to again see step change breakthroughs that if you'd have asked everybody today, does this happen within the next five years? Everybody would say no, and then they do happen. And that is the basically the history of recent science. And here are some of those that uh, uh, that could have shockingly big uh, quantum uh, uh, leaps uh, forward. Um, if you jump to the next slide, um, scary INSEAD story last dinner I had before COVID kicked in. I was out in California and I happened to be sitting next to the number two person from INSEAD from in Fontainebleau in, um, in Europe and just spent six months in China. I said, what's the scariest thing you saw? And he said, the businesses and the government and the military's ability to onboard innovative startups and scale them is better than anywhere on the planet by a mile. That is something that should uh, uh, worry us. What the English and the French have done from policy structure, uh, knowledge sharing, partnering with labs, with uh, Ministry of Defense, um, with scientific universities uh, is definitely fantastically good and we should worry us um, uh, a lot. Um, and I think leveraging the labs will be even more essential that and the, uh, and the great resources we have at, uh, at state schools, we've got to figure out a better way uh, to accelerate that and, and compete uh, with those. I mean, the great work today, but the competition is going to uh, heat up and that will require some structural platform, fiscal uh, uh, and policy work. Um, I, I do know there's a lot of cross uh, lab collaboration. Uh, I saw some recently cool things on quantum chemistry. I saw some other things on quantum, um, but that needs to be across a broader innovation ecosystem and be purposely uh, managed. 
Um, look, the answers to this thing are unknown, but the good news is we're very clear on the questions, and I think that's where we uh, that's where we excel. They're private organizations uh, allied with government, you know, to to a pretty good extent, with some pretty powerful people at the helm doing good things. Council on Competitiveness is led by the chairman of Bank of America, for instance. Um, there's a, a an amazing array of uh, uh, powerful seasoned people at the Kroc Institute. And then the International Science Reserve, a smaller thing out of the New York Academy of Sciences, another uh, another example. Um, jump to the next slide, please. So uh, this gets a lot of lip service and people don't really end up doing much about this. A lot of companies are talking about, you know, uh, ecosystem competition and we're going to be great at that and really don't do anything but um, lip service. The, the key to being good in an ecosystem uh, uh, model is, is, are you really the partner of choice? Are you great at partnering? Uh, and that question really has to be answered by the people you partner with. I, I've worked at several companies that thought they were, and were actually, uh, really terrible. That'll create, um, a structural economic, uh, business groups that look like the old Zaibatsus from, uh, Japan. It's one of my favorite words, which translates, I think literally translates to money clan. Um, Flexibility and agility will really matter, which is not something that goes hand in hand with, you know, uh, building new uh, change outputs. Um, and that's simply because you know, members will cycle in and out of ecosystems. Um, architecting these structures to answer the questions you haven't thought of yet is key. Uh, and I know that sounds like somebody who got trained in philosophy, but it, it's really, really important in times of uh, uh, change. Then, and as I repeated before, um, all of this new tech is hands on play with it. Be familiar. Uh, uh, super, uh, super essential to do that. Jump to the next slide. Um, we all know that small agile kills big slow. We've seen that economically. We've seen it militarily. Uh, big agile uh, beats everything. It's been my anchor pitch for landing uh, those last three big jobs uh, uh, that I had, including well, those three plus uh, uh, Verizon. For the first time in history, I think this is going to be actually uh, um, more prevalent than just a, a all near impossibility, which has been in, in the past. And it's not about agile teams or using uh, um, agile methodologies. It's a intentional architecture that is nested Right, you can't be great at Gen AI and suck at AI in general, and suck at um, IT in general, and suck at uh, the strategic application of technology inside a company. That's a Matryoshka doll that you've got to manage very, uh, uh, very cleverly. And then again, everything, uh, everything accelerates. So if we jump to the uh, the next slide. Um, uh, other things you got to think about here, migratory, migratory models for talent. Um, I, I think we will have some, if you think back to my story about GDP and cross-cultural uh, conflictive currents, um, that's a national security issue from talent supply chain. Um, there's going to be vastly more AI infusion into everything. We talked about the 10 Ps. Um, value chain mapping and execution. Um, for resiliency and optimization, I think that's a valid act exercise, uh, and I think it's for all, all components. And if we start to think about leveraging national labs for superior um, economic uh, competitiveness, I think that's valid for uh, the labs. Um, real risk tolerance, in, including making innovation bets, knowing a significant amount will fail, um, will become really, really important. Most organizations are really awful at that and think that they're not. Um, that leads to, you know, a problem that we've, we've seen in many, uh, uh many areas economically and, and historically where you've got the army for the last war lined up. And then the other thing, which is a bit metaphysical is change mastery really, really matters. I, I got to teach a class on how to create a culture of innovation down at SOCOM when Admiral uh, McRaven, uh, ran it. And I said, look, I'd love to do that. Um. Uh, but I'm only going to do it if you let me teach change management also, because there's no point understanding that if you can't do the change management. There are four major change management models. The top one is twice as effective as the next best one, uh, but almost nobody can talk to you about what those are or or why that matters. So it does turn out that the, 
the metaphysics of change uh, is really, really important and often ignored. Jumping to the next slide, a uh, tiny bit of a Ukraine sidebar, because I think that's hugely um, uh, germane in, in, in these times. Um, and I know we're talking about technology and science, but the, thing, the things that are coming out of there's a morale matters, morale and purpose matters uh, way more uh, um, than you think. Readiness, uh, again, matters as you're going through what will be um, an economic um, uh, battle. These are not um, motto communications driven things. These are multi-year foundational commitments and, and only come out of intentional uh, uh, design. Uh, I think there's an ethics thing there. I think there's a, a drone mosaic warfare JADC2 uh, uh, thing. I think all of that military thinking bleeds over into uh, um, event-driven architectures that, that we will start to see in all, uh, all domains. And then I think you're going to see innovation and design um, become a lot more focused and will include um, uh, optimizing for spend flows, right? What, what do I get for the impact? And because there are questions around some of that, right? A Javelin and a Switchblade 600 both blow up tanks. They have very, very different cost structures. Uh, a TB2 cost two to $5 million, uh, a, a Raptor, which is slightly different, cost 42. Corvo drone, I'll show you it on the next page um, if, we, uh, if we jump to that. There's also an interesting link to a reconstruction article that I wrote on, uh, on that. So that flat pack is 12 of those things in a box. They cost like 3,000 bucks each. They're made of cardboard, so they're really hard to uh, uh, detect electronically. 70 miles, 12 pounds of ordnance, um, they cost less than $3,000 and they come in a flat pack, right? And so uh, design doesn't have to be sexy and shiny and the most, it just has to be economically uh, uh, optimized. So if we jump to the next, uh, uh, next slide, so the final thoughts, industrial revolution scale of change over the next eight years, it will be S&T driven, national competitiveness, national health security will in great part depend on increase of our national uh, assets and, the, and our treasures like the labs, there's, there's nothing like it uh, uh, at the level and the quality uh, and, and the scale that we have anywhere in the world uh, uh, compared to uh, the US. It's something we should be super proud of and it's almost a secret to a lot of folks. I think the everyday people have no idea how big of a deal that, that is and, and could be. Um, ending up, uh, on the positive side of the creative destruction cycle really, really, really does matter. And thank you very much. That's the end of my deck. And I was a minute and 30 seconds over, 31 seconds.